All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm feeling very calm and chill after uh, the musical selections there from Marin Disney. <laughs> Uh, so we have one more section for, uh, for today, and uh, we will be um, moderated in this section by James Pinnock. So he's going to continue the discussion on the hardware provisioning lifecycle, and I will pass it over to James to take it away. Good morning, everyone. All right, yeah, so let's kick this off. Um, in fact, where we left off in the, the first session, I think is a great place to pick this up here. We had started to talk about uh, uh, firmware a little bit. Um, so to start with, you know, one of the things I just kind of want to throw out there is how many of you are, are sort of like 100% or, or mostly on UEFI versus uh, how many folks, I'm curious, are still using BIOS? Um, this is something we're still doing just because it's for us, it's a lesser common denominator thing. And I wondered if uh, anyone else want to talk about like, are you doing, uh, are you using UVFI and some of the more advanced features of UVFI right now? I think um, on our side, we, <laughs> the answer is it depends. And sometimes the hardware can be very finicky uh, for UVFI and depending on the OS you're installing. But most of the time we try to go for UFI mainly because just generally you get faster boot times and just kind of the idea of future proofing the infrastructure. Um, I don't know that we're taking advantage of anything like any fancy UFI features that we can take advantage of, which we don't. Okay. Yeah. And so that's actually good to know. It hadn't occurred to me that there could be like some finicky, finickiness, finickitude with uh, UEFI. And um, Kurt, on the Zoom chat, I see that you're actually using both, uh, predominantly BIOS. And I was wondering if you'd be able to share a little bit about uh, about kind of uh, why you use one versus the other or any experience you've had. Well, I still have gear that is ancient that I'm trying to leverage that just works on BIOS. And I've run into some issues with the UA of Fiboot. Um, in older versions of uh, CentOS where it would just on a, I know on an upgrade to like 7.5 to 7.6, the UEFI went sideways. I do have instances where I have some cards that demand that I boot with UEFI, um, at least to do the initial configuration. Mm -hmm. um, and I have run into the same kind of issues where some hardware is finicky when I do boot UEFI and some hardware is finicky when I don't. So it really depends upon the piece of, of gear or, you know, set of servers that I'm deploying at the moment. Okay. I, That's good enough. Sorry, I've go a, ahead. I've seen a lot of people still trying to use BIOS. Uh, and a lot of the cases where people are forced into UFI, it's because their hardware needs it or they need the memory access for the hardware to be able to have the greatest performance possible or some of these more edge cases that you don't normally think about with hardware, but they are things that you have to consider. Yeah, that's a good point. And then for those of you that are still using BIOS like us, um, I noticed that some of our vendors, I think, are actually starting to either do or are talking about actually charging an extra fee um, per machine to support BIOS as well. Um, so I, there's certainly an impetus for us to, to want to get off of uh, BIOS, not just for you know, future proofing with technology advantages, but also just to, to be able to take to uh, um, just to save that extra surcharge on hardware. Oh, Ava has a great question. If uh, anyone's using UEFI su to support secure boot and related things. So that's actually, um, in fact, one of the things that's coming up here. So uh, we can even skip ahead to that if, if that's something that anyone's interested. Does anyone use uh, UEFI uh, to support secure boot um, some options of the including this would also be like measured boot or even using signed uh, images i think that was uh, there was something that we were uh, looking at but i think one of the struggles with this and could be just a general infrastructure struggle is like when you want to implement these new things that some of the subset of your new hardware supports it you have like an older subset that still has no support for it and kind of makes it a little difficult to implement it. And it feels like you're half doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
we're we're starting to do in some cases uh, in parts of our infrastructure we're actually using signed kernels um not on our OpenStack managed pieces right now. We're actually doing it in our secure edge sites, which are not currently OpenStack managed just because we, we have some features we need to add before we get there. But uh, in those environments, we are doing uh, signed images. Um, and in those cases, uh, the signature is actually put into the, the or the, the public key, I think is actually put into the TPM on those hosts. Um, and then the the kernel has to match that that signature. We want to make that the that the the default for everything. And so part of that is is us adding the UEFI support to our on premise premises ironic, not our edge sites, but our on premises ironic stuff right now. And then we want to actually do that by default for all the bare metal stuff. Um, there's some tricks to that because that that causes some problems when it comes to uh, allowing, if we ever want to allow our application owners to use um, uh, uh, snapshot images to, to deploy their instances, at least on bare metal, we certainly encourage that for VMs, but for bare metal, uh, we don't currently support that. And if once there's an image signing element there, that's going to complicate that a bit. That's something we do want, though. So I'd really like to know if anyone sort of addressed this in any way, if you've built any automation into how you provide base images um, to folks. Um, uh, just a question. So when you're using these signed images, are you signing them yourself? Or are you using like the, the signed ones that are kind of pre-signed from dollar vendor, dollar sign vendor? We're actually signing them all ourselves. So we okay. build our own base images. We, um, you know, we, take the, we take the kernel, we build our own base images. Um, and then for the ones that are deployed in signed locations that we then sign the kernel as part of building the image. Yeah. We, we don't have that challenge because we kind of rely on the vendor signed images, so. No, okay, that makes that easier. Yeah. I Do think you... most people, Go ahead. I think I was gonna say, I think most people, at least those I've talked to tend to use the vendor supplied images. They tend not to be doing their own PK, PKI and, uh, certificate signing inside their infrastructure for secure boot. Right. Which is actually an interesting question then um, for folks doing their own, P or actually, um, I guess before I skip ahead too quick, so it sounds like most people are actually using the vendor signed images. Um, are there, is there anyone else out there like, uh, like, uh, like my team or my company uh, that is signing their own? I have a question for you along that. Does that mean you're also updating your TPM to include your own keys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I should say it's currently only happening on the machines that are going into those edge sites where we're actually using the signed images. We want to do this for everything. And so part of that is actually how do we start to sign images for, for all machines? And so this is actually gonna change how we do our hardware intake process a little bit to you know how do we how do we automate this do we have like a clean room section of the data center where machines can go in and then they can be um and then the the trusted uh keys get put onto the tpm there um that's i think one of the things we still have to work out no it's reasonable that that interacting with the tpm is going to require i'm assuming you have to do that from a, in a trusted place anyway but yeah um, yeah, I'd be interested to see the process you're using for doing that, because I think um, being able to add keys into the TPM as a standard process would open up uh, the use of TPM much more broadly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's going to be the thing for us, because right now, since we're only doing this for hardware that goes into our secure edge sites, um, it's low enough that it's basically just, you know, a human with a thumb drive, if necessary, they can go and they can put the correct thing on. But doing this scalably is something we kind of need to start thinking about now uh, so that we can work with our site ops people to sort of figure out like what should the process be? What's the, the chain of trust for hardware coming into the data center um, and, and receiving this, uh, receiving the image? The key, receiving the key, the TPM. Yeah, I don't want to pull this off, but I, 
if you want to contact me offline, I'm happy to talk about it more. Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we have processes and we've talked to people about stuff like that. Um, you know, actually, there's um, there's a bullet here specifically on that. So I'll, I'll touch on some of these other points. And then I think I actually really want to come to exactly that point. You know, actually, let's talk about that right now. Um, could you could you share what the process you use for securing or for programming your TPMs is? I, I, we don't. So the I don't have a process for if I had one, I I'd wrap it and we include it in a workflow and just make it part of standard process. Um, so that's the that's the okay. question to me that that's going down the rabbit hole. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, it I just I just don't know I if see. it's vendor specific or what the tools are. Um, I have five or six different places we can poke stuff in. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just need, you know, I, I don't have the operational infrastructure to, to play with it outside of it. Oh, right. Um, I, I, well, what I do know is that we, uh, and part of the challenge with the TPM and the secure boot pieces is that you, it's not a hundred percent thing most places. So you have to be able to detect whether the system's in secure mode or not, ser serve up, uh, we actually serve up different um, uh, IPIXI, a different different boot stages, depending on secure or not secure. And even a secure system might boot back into non-secure modes um, to perform certain operations. Uh, and so you, you actually have to be able to bounce back and forth from that perspective. All right. That's fair. I'm wondering, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm wondering if anyone from Keylime has joined us today because they have an, a bit of code that allows taking ownership of the TPM and doing key injection to the TPM and then basically doing attestation of the machine. Yeah, that's, so this would be sort of like this, the signed measured bit then. Basically, yes. Uh, you'd end up asserting the key, establishing the relationship, and then there's a whole nother step and process beyond that. Yeah, I can actually um, share something on that to start. Um, this is again in our secure edge sites. We are actually doing uh, measured boot, so where certain values on the machine have to be consistent, um, including like certain. I think certain firmware versions have to do a certain thing. Um, the certain values in the BIOS have to be set a certain way. In addition to, uh, so all of those things have to be true to unlock the TPM, um, which then contains the uh, certificate to validate the, the I think the, uh, the, the, the kernel. I, I'll look and see if that we, if, if the team that designed and built that infrastructure, I'll see if they released a white paper because I know they released one internally and I thought it was really interesting. So I'll see if they've got something they can share publicly. And if, uh, if so, I'll, uh, I'll come back later and add it to this, uh, to this, uh, to the Cether pad. Um, that, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, that's a fascinating use case. Um, and I was asking the team and my team in the background and, and they haven't seen any customers using it, using the measure boot, um, but that's that's super interesting. We did have an attestation process where we would go with our in-memory uh, discovery image, uh, collect a signature for the, the drives. And then uh, since we boot back into that, when it when the systems come back up, we can, we can make sure that the systems haven't um, change that the drives haven't changed from a signature perspective without actually booting to the drives. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we worked out that as an attestation process. Um, and then, then you can encrypt the drives and then, um, require a Lux key to, to complete the boot. Okay. Uh, Different, different, I mean, in some ways that to us was more secure than a TPM, which just makes sure that the OS hasn't been tampered with um, and that you're getting the OS image you think rather than that the system itself can't be activated until after a, a Lux key has been provided. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, something that the, this kind of this conversation brings up and Ava said this here in chat that they would like to see some SOPs documented in open source for adding and managing keys and TPM 
they'd be happy to add to that. And, and then also there's gonna be some architecture specific pieces. I actually really like that idea. I think that would be uh, really, really useful. I'd like to um, definitely be a part of a working group that would own that and just produce it. Maybe we can author a paper together or something or, or put something on the, like the OpenStack website or Wiki even that just says like, here's a list of good standard operating procedures just to help other operators and deployers get started. Um, so if you're interested, if someone wants to put a line on the etherpad, um, we can just put our names, put our names and email addresses there. And then uh, let's all circle up and we can, we can talk about that. Um, I think that would be really useful. So one of the next things I want to talk about is, um, you know, and, and this I think is really helpful because I think uh, something that just came up is really ties into this is reasserting hardware being safe for reuse. So, um, and this is particularly important, I think, for those of you that are running bare metal in sort of more of a public cloud kind of way, or you're hosting, using physical hosts to host other people's applications. Um, what are things that you're doing to assert that the hardware is safe for reuse from one tenant to the next? Are you are you wiping drives? Are you doing firmware inspection? Well, I think um, one of the things that's uh, kind of hard is, you know, it's like, how do you make sure you close all of the different things and you don't miss one tiny thing, right? It's not a virtual machine where everything disappears. Um, and so for us, at least on our side, we've been using uh, some of the ironic cleaning steps. Um, and, you know, it's maybe not as efficient because some, some of them just like take very long time, but a very long time is a lot better than any security issues. Um, but unfortunately, I think the hard part is um, remains like the firmwares and, and things like that. And that's something that's very hard to to, to change and modify because you know a lot of these cleaning steps I think don't actually include flashing firmwares and you would really need the system that supports out of band firmware flashing uh, to do something like that. So um, it's definitely a really hard problem to solve and it's one of those things where you can make a lot of progress but it's hard to fully lock it down and and, and be like on a super clean uh, slate on that. It is and it it seems like the problem that at least I seem to encounter in the open source community with asserting firmware flashing is maintaining that possible matrix of device to firmware image, the version that needs to be on the machine to the version that should never be on that machine and how to manage all that and represent that into something that can programmatically execute and run. And also hopefully not break the machines like we, it's kind of funny to think about, but we actually lost a third party CI last year because someone went and upgraded firmware and bricked the machines. And it wasn't ironic that they did it, but it was someone in, that plugged a thumb drive into the machines in the data center and they just didn't raise a ticket at that point. Yeah, so this is interesting because this definitely is part of the life cycle stuff that's really interesting to me. Um, you know, the, this element of how do you build a matrix of supported firmware? And so we have we have sort of a, a, a high level working agreement with our internal performance engineering team of like how we probably should do, be doing this, but we're not right now. Um, does anyone operate in a single or multi-vendor environment where you're doing automated firmware updates in any way? I know Rackspace was in uh, with On Metal. They actually had an entire uh, an entire hardware manager that would do all of this for them. Uh, but it was in band, and it was explicitly tested to operate on those machines. And they only had like so many variations in their data center, as opposed to what you end up with most data centers, where it's orders of magnitude more variation. Hmm. That's a good point. And then Rob, you said this is actually something you're doing right now. It's it's a core thing that I mean, it's our our expectation is heterogeneous. Um, yeah, what's I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about what's what's the what's the quest. I I think this is it's subtly more complex because even inside of a single, even if you're single vendor, uh, changes within the vendor's management tooling 
will cause drift that effectively makes the systems heterogeneous. Um, and so we see this all the time where even one version of firmware, like a firmware patch comes in and a value of the firmware changes or the behavior of the firmware patch process changes. Um, and so we're constantly playing whack-a-mole on, on challenges like this across the board. Um, Interesting. So this is cases where like, for example, for upgrading like IPMI firmware, normally the process is like you upgrade IPMI firmware and then reboot and then upgrade BIOS or vice versa. But, but there's like a chain, there's an order of operations in which firmwares you upgrade in which order and not just that, but also the tooling and manner in which you upgrade a piece of firmware. Plus also, um, like I seem to, we, we experienced something recently where we upgraded firmware and it actually changed some other BIOS settings on the mm -hmm. host. And it actually just upgrading the, the NIC firmware, I believe caused the boot device order to get reset back to hard drive first. So it didn't pick the boot. Pretty common. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so those are things that you've dealt with. And it's interesting is it, um, I don't think that there's any central place out in the world where any of this is being captured. Cause I think that would probably be really useful for all the different vendor, uh, all the different consumers of hardware. Yeah. I mean, we, we capture it from an automation perspective as we, as we keep, you know, having to add, you know, uh, you know, these, this check and that check and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. We don't like, we call them quirks, but we don't um, sort of publish a quirks, never even quite thought of like all the quirks. It'd be useful because it's, it's tribal knowledge at, in the, at the end of the day, but it's, I mean, it's bizarre stuff. It's things like, um, different firmware, they change the way that the password um, difficulties requirements are enforced and it's there, it's all over the map. So we end up having to be very resilient from uh, this, make this change, check this change. Um, usually we use the vendor tools, actually always we use the vendor tools to do that. Um, so we come back to talking to the vendors about, hey, we tried this and it didn't work or we tried this and it has a 20% failure rate um that's uh, that, and that's the other side to this it's it's not just that it's heterogeneous there's also a significant failure rate um uh in some of these op these firmware operations where you they don't take the first time and so you have to assess and validate and then repeat i i seem to remember that at least one vendor out there does have some out of band tooling so you can do out of band uh, firmware assert assertion. But even then, I think it's, again, one of those things where sometimes it may not work or it ends up booting the secondary ROM and of how and restarting power. And all of a sudden you're going, why didn't this work? We, yeah, we spent a lot of time dealing with out of band. Um, it's, it just, it's can be not as reliable or time, very time sensitive. So that we, we rely very heavily on the in-band processes. In part because they're very transparent for us. So if something's going wrong, we can usually see it because we have a live OS uh, to play with. I mean, you can see stuff happening out of band also, but it just becomes a little bit more of a, you know, what's figuring out what's going on and, and what it's talking to and all the all those things. Yeah, it's a bit it's a bit more opaque when you don't actually have uh, full insight as a, as a consumer of the hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's opaqueness is, is generally um, <laughs> always harder. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess, you know, the heterogeneity is real. And actually, UFI and and we were talking about UFI and, and BIOS modes. Those actually can have different tools or some of the tools only work in BIOS modes. Um, still, uh, some of them only work in UFI mode. So it sort of is a, there's, there's some, some hard things to deal with. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's also the fact some hardware have completely different firmware images depending on UFI or BIOS mode. Yeah. And one doesn't update the other. Yeah. And so I think one of the good points that came up here right, is that even if you're in like a mono vendor environment, is that you still end up having these different permutations such that, like to Rob's point, it still ends up being kind of a heterogeneous environment. Um, so I think that something that would be interesting in the long term is if there was a way to figure out like is there a way to have different deployers come together and 
uh, at least collaborate on like a list of, you know, this is actually another great opportunity for us to kind of produce an artifact here, which is, can we start to capture somewhere together just our experiences like, oh, for this vendor and this hardware it has to be done in this way and this one in that way and see if we can come up with a, um, a sort of matrix of here's the order of operations for these, these given fingerprints of hardware. Um, I think there would be some really interesting opportunity for conversation on that and see if we can, because that's something we need, for example. And, and right now that's kind of what I'm most interested in is, is how um, you can all help me with my problems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which I'm sure that's, that's all of your uh, primary interest as well. And so I think this would be another thing where we could reach out and maybe see if other people uh, are interested in talking. And maybe this is something also for the large scale, um, large scale SIG. The, and I kind of want to roll past that and look, I think this sort of ties into one of the next things, which is we talked about, okay, we're going through, we're updating firmware and we're reasserting hardware is safe for use. Um, and part of that is actually running the risk of if somebody's installed compromised firmware on a host, you know, detecting that and remediating that. Has anyone successfully built automation to handle that use case? Like really going through inspecting the hardware and saying like, yes, disk firmware has not been compromised. And to so, that end, actually, has anyone, does anyone have any operational stories about encountering exactly that? So, okay, uh, first question, I don't have an answer to the second question, but I, my hope is eventually we have some sort of key lime, key lime integration where that entire process would basically flag the machine as being compromised by check, when she checks the checksums and the values and measurement fails, machines blocked and at that point, cleaning's done. Uh, you need to go rip that machine out of the data center at that point. Um, unfortunately, we're not there yet, and, but people are working on it. Cool, thank you. Um, and then, so did anyone have any horror stories to share on uh, actually encountering compromised firmware on their hosts? I don't, but I would be curious to know, like, because I feel like you'd have to have such a commitment level to be able to actually go as far as like reverse engineer it whole firmware and make it functional for that system, but also do whatever you're trying to, to accomplish yeah. maliciously, I guess. I, I have, they're, they're not my stories to share, but I, I can give you a, I can tell broad enough brush strokes for it that I think I can share. Um, sure. Not not necessarily malicious, but um, firmware changes that are unexpected. Um, so I you know I, I think if you step back from the malicious attack and just assume that if somebody if you're giving people a piece of hardware and they have to make a change to it in firmware that they that is very possible that somebody will change the firmware to meet their needs without telling you. Um, and so from that perspective, that's, that's something you have to be prepared for. I think there's a different, there's, there's a reset of firmware and validate the firmware if you can trust that somebody didn't put something malicious in it. As soon as you assume it was a malicious intent, even the checksum validation, I think, can become tricky. Yeah. From that, because the vendors aren't really building tools that, val that, that stamp the firmware that I've seen. I'd love to know if they do. Maybe you, if you has some capabilities to check some itself that I, I'm missing. So a lot of the firmwares actually will give you a checksum. The downside is that the way it works, as far as I know, is you're actually querying the firmware and it just tells you what the checksum okay. is, um, which means that, that uh, oh, uh, Ava, did you wanna uh, jump in on this one? I see you raised your hand. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, without having an out of band mechanism like a TPM that can measure the firmware uh, signatures, so the, sorry, the, the firmware checksums without really powering them on. Like Rob was starting to say, you, you do rely on each uh, firmware, each microcontroller to tell you itself what its checksum is. And it's been demonstrated for several years now that it's quite possible to make them lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's exactly the thing I was kind of wondering at is if someone's figured out a way of doing that. Oh, yeah. but it sounds like what you're saying is actually uh, doing some more work, some of this pre-work with the TPM, it's actually possible to position things. And then I guess that makes sense that if you have signed kernels, 
uh, and you're doing some other, uh, like other, maybe others uh, measure boot things, you can actually put the machine in a state where um, there, you, you, it, it's much harder to use like a rootkit or something to go and actually change the, the firmware on the host. Precisely. The, if if yeah, a malicious right. actor is trying to use a, um, you know, a kernel that contains a rootkit, you need the trusted boot to verify the kernel. But to have trusted boot really be trusted, right? The attackers moved down a layer and began finding ways to compromise the firmware, um, whether it's the boot firmware or some microcontroller on the board or a, a SATA device or a USB device. Um, you know, there's lots of tiny computers in our computers. Right. And verifying as much of that as possible. Um, and Intel began to do and, and publish a bunch of this work circa 2015, 16, um, talked about it at OpenStack conferences back then a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. it, and the work's still ongoing. Multiple vendors have stuff going in that space right now. Um, but it's always you know, some sort of an add-on chip or add-on card to do the out-of-band measurement of the firmware. Without that, it's kind of futile. I believe TPM V2s are supposed to be able to do the out-of-band measurement of the firmware, but I think the conundrum is that I don't think they halt by default. I think they just change the returned register. Yeah, I believe you're correct. So, so this is actually something that'd be really good to add to that the TPM thing we're talking about collaborating on um, that list above. And just as a reminder for folks, if you're interested in collaborating like SOPs and docs for managing keys on a TPM and provisioning TPMs and sort of the whole life cycle there uh, in both in in large data centers, but also in smaller deployer environments. Um, if you look up online 200, um, there's a currently list there. So please add your name and email so that we can uh, we can circle up and start to talk about that. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that, Ava. I really appreciate that. Um, good points. You know. um, and so kind of moving on here, we actually sort of uh, jumped ahead, which is really good, I think. So we talked about, you know, what, um, you know, are people doing periodic updates of firmware? And the answer is sort of like, yes, but you know, it, it's quite complex. And so there's, I think, some opportunity for us to talk further there in the future. Um, uh, reval revalidating hardware before returning it to the pool. We, we touched on that. Someone uh, as a reminder to set your BMC firm, uh, and firmware control passwords. That's an excellent point as well. Um, Actually, this makes me want to so throw in another question for those of you that are doing um, that are using things like IPMI or Redfish. Uh, the security for IPMI leaves something to be desired. Um, something we do is we actually have IPMI is actually on an air gapped network, uh, and that's something that you're going to have to tie the conductors into for if say you're using ironic. That's something we do. I'm curious. If anyone else has any other examples of things they do to secure IPMI in their network. Yeah, that's something similar on our side here, which is, you know, put IPMI on its own as far away from everything else in the world. And kind of that's like step zero to ensuring that it's all secure. I guess the other kind of concerning thing that can happen is um, I know some. Uh, devices allow you to disable the host of configuring anything inside uh, the IPMI config. And so that's also useful to do um, if the hardware supports it so that you don't end up in a, in a machine that's like unmanageable because someone ran something and changed the IPMI password. And now you're like, you can't manage that host anymore. Right. I, I think one thing Beyond disabling the host access, I think at least moving forward at, with Redfish, the fact that we're now starting, to, or we, we should by spec be getting a network access network, like make TCP connections to the BMC a sort of access. And if you think about the, you know, most BMCs, they're basically some other small computer that runs like Linux <laughs> that could be compromised potentially. So we're actually creating a whole nother attack vector by improving the manageability of these machines. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And Rob, to your question on the chat, um, for mm -hmm. ours, it's actually, it's it's basically bridge. It's, it's physically a okay. separate network, but certain machines have second interfaces on it, like our ironic conductors. That's that's what I was, air, air gap thing for us means there's no network access at all. 
So yeah. Yeah, if, if the server, if the provisioning control has access, the thing, the thing that, which is what we'd recommend always, um, the challenge becomes um, if you want a, a actually console access uh, through that network, then what you've now done is now you need a proxy uh, to forward to that. And I haven't seen um, a good proxy IPMI um, system like that would it would be really nice to be able to see a proxy you know a proxy for IPMI so that they're at, I'm saying IPMI but I mean console IP console um, so that you could then um, provide controlled access forward from a control point that would be a, that would be a, a nice add like we have all the we have all the data to do it I just haven't seen anybody with a nice uh, utility for that. I know Packet has something internally, but I haven't seen how they did. I haven't seen the source code released on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I want to talk to the team we have that actually runs a console reader, uh, uh, a serial over LAN basically access infrastructure. Mm. So we run on, there's a, another set of hosts that are also bridged into this IPMI network and they run the, um, they run a program that connects to every serial console for every machine in that data center. Um, or at least it's a subset because we actually have scale scale issues. So we actually have to have multiple of these machines now. But the way it works is then they have an API set up. So folks that um, that are in the approved access list for that given machine based on the, the property of the application owner that, that is using that machine, they can run a command from their laptop and it actually uh, sets up a TLS connection to uh, the one of these API proxies. And then the thing that's running in the background that's connecting to all the serial of a LAN, it's actually logging everything to a file. And so nice. when they connect, it replays the last N lines of the log. So you get some context of what's going on. And then you could just log in and do things from there. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty useful. Um, it manages many, many, many tens of thousands of nodes per data center. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. Um, I I want to ask the team if they're willing to look into open sourcing it because I haven't personally seen anything yet that operates at that kind of scale. But I think it would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Uh, I know there's been some talk of similar things in the ironic community, considering we do we do have things like the SoCat console proxy. But mm -hmm. something with logging is definitely something that a lot of people would take advantage of because that gives you a lot of insight. And even allows like things like bare metal CI to be much more effective, mm -hmm. especially if your machines don't boot. Oh, I can see why it didn't boot. Okay, now I know what to do or can't do. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, if you're doing because one of the yeah actually that's an interesting point because one of the other advantages is if you're doing inspection and you run like like some hardware burn-in stuff. You know, like an example could be if you just sort of relentlessly run Ubench. Um, uh, every time you, and this sort of moves that us to the next step in like the day-to-day -day hardware life cycle, you know, whenever you re-inspect hardware, like after you, someone deletes an instance, something I want us to do is start re-inspecting the hardware and actually do a check of the CPU memory and disk. If the memory is bad or CPU is bad in some circumstances, it's detectable and you can just send it, you know, you can just uh, send a message from the instance to, to ironic to notify it. In other cases, if you hit something bad, the machine just crashes. So that's a case where it'd be really useful if there was better tie-in between Ironic and the serial console to actually capture that output and say, hey, you know, I was running inspection, I was testing the memory, the machine crashed, here's the last thing I saw before it horked. And that way there's like some more usable information that goes to the operator as opposed to, you know, the machine died while testing memory, you're gonna have to go look at the console yourself and figure it out, you know, go dig in as opposed to auto creating a ticket with the relevant information. That would be something I would really like to see. Um, so moving on to, you know, we talked about like day-to-day, -day, the firmware management, and there's a lot of opportunity there. We talked about some of those other pieces and I feel like there's a good opportunity here to talk now about sort of the larger picture. You know, earlier Mohammed talked about data center management stuff and one of the things I think then that's part of it is, <clears throat> you know, once you're, you're running, you have machines deployed in a data center, um, there's some larger problems that come down to do with like thermal and power management. And so one example is that is detecting hotspots in a data center. 
Um, is anyone building or running any automation that helps detect hotspots or um, in a data center and to allow you to go and if you're doing hot cold rows like move some floor tiles around to try and balance things out or even um, the next step from that would even be are you doing anything to detect this and even shut some workloads down in some parts of the data center and power them up in other parts of the data center to balance things out I'll, I'll I'll go with what I did years ago, which was I just kept the thresholds on the out of band sensors ridiculously low. So if air intakes hurt hit like 90 or 80 or something like that, I don't remember exactly what it was, then I'd get a warning. I wouldn't actually have that warning uh, trigger page, but it would give me enough information if I loaded Stats Console. I'd go, oh, I've got six machines in this in this rack that are warmer than. The rest of the data center, I should probably go look at that and actually reevaluate the airflow. Mm. But yeah. definitely not a, a tooling to automatically go, oh, I should probably start shifting the workload around. Right. Which makes sense. Because back then that would have been pretty, you know, that was pretty that would that would have been a pretty uncommon use case anyway. It's actually automatically moving the workload. Um, something I'd done in the past, um, I mean it's so long ago is written in Perl. Uh, is I wrote something that was actually going through one of our smaller data centers and it was querying all the smart PDUs and just asking them what their temperature sensors saw. And then it was taking that information and put it into a database, um, which also meant it, it captured the power draw from the PDU, which was useful as well, because we could detect which PDUs were overloaded. And if you've ever had to like go and install loose gear in a data center, you know, it gets to the point where you're trying to, you're doing the math and calculating how many watts are actually being used in a given rack. Uh, to see if you can sneak another machine in. So it record all that. And then the the heat information went to actually a heat map for the data center. So you could look and say, you know, you just glance at a map and say, oh, wow, this this row is starting to trend red. You know, we should do something about it. Um, that was one of our older data centers that was kind of a traditional hot, cold row design. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has built anything like that, but if you have, I'm guessing that uh, folks would be pretty interested in that. Um, I believe now our team that runs our data centers, um, um, what they're doing is they're actually pulling IPMI on host to get the same, at, at the very least, the same um, uh, thermal information. So that way you can just query every machine, see what the temperatures are, and from that they can start to get an idea of what the you know where things are in the data center. One thing that we we have in it is ironic is we have the sensor periodic sensor data collection, and that will include the vendor wired sensors uh, that are in the BMC for things like fans, temperature. That way it can be reported back and you can potentially grab that data out of the data stream and present that to a user or to logic and leverage it. No. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even know about that. I'll need to talk to my team because that might be something in the long run, the, uh, are the team that's currently gathering all that data, they might want to switch to just uh, using the Ironic API to uh, to fetch that. I think we have to upgrade our version of Ironic to get there, though. Uh, the sensor data collection's been there a long time, and the data collection's not exposed via the API. It's exposed via either a Prometheus exporter or via uh, the message bus. Gotcha. OK. Something that uh, we do is um, given that we run the hardware exporters, a lot of the systems will usually have inlet, air, uh, inlet like air temperature sensors and outlet air temperature sensors. Um, and so we rely a lot on those and not as much of a rack level probe, but kind of a server uh, level probe. We also set up alerting um, that's based on the limits that are published also by the exporter. So different machines obviously have different temperature limits for their inlets and, and outlet temperatures. Like for example, the like GPU heavy machines that have the GPUs in the front, their inlets need to be a lot higher, sorry, a lot lower than the normal machines that will take like room temperature um, going, going in. And so that's an interesting thing that uh, we do on that. Um, also, I, I'm interested on that same subject is on, you mentioned you kind of have an older, some of the data centers are more old than traditional. Uh, like cold aisle, hot aisle type of thing. But um, has anyone worked with any facilities that are doing anything like, you know, 
having the entire data center in ambient temperature and having these like really thick doors in the back that are uh, kind of have big radiators. So you stand behind them and there's just cold air coming out of these racks if the door's closed, obviously. Yeah, we, we actually build, that's how we build uh, our newer data centers now. Um, if you look up the um, Verizon Media or Yahoo um, Compute Coop data centers, so this is all public information, um, there's some really cool infographics that'll do a better job explaining this than I can, but they're really interesting because they're built around the idea of passive cooling. So the whole data center is built sort of like a gigantic chicken coop. Um, it looks like a really, really big barn, basically. And so uh, there are louvers on the outside of the buildings that air comes in through. And one of the parts that I find most interesting is that um, all of our compute nodes are, uh, you know, they're in uh, cabinets and the cabinets are assembled together in pods and the pods are actually sealed. So the servers face outwards in the pods and then air is drawn in through the front of the server then exiting, exiting the rear. So what this means is that um, the, there's a higher pressure zone inside of the pod which is then ducted up to this cupola in the top of the building. So, like a, so there's a convective cooling effect. So this means that the servers are the air pumps that are driving air out of the data center. And so which means that those are helping pull air in through those, um, those passive louvers on the outside of the building. There's also uh, membranes there behind the louvers that have, can have water pumped in them to, uh, for a swamp cooling effect to help chill, chair the, chill the air intake even further. Now the interesting problem here is that if we turn off too many servers in a pod, the, we can get to the point where there's no longer enough air coming in to maintain that high pressure zone. And so what can happen is that air can start blowing out backwards from the powered off servers, which means that if we turn off too many machines, we can actually cause a, a, an undesirable thermal event. So we can actually cause the air in the rest of the day so it get a little bit warmer. So there's some automation um, that the our site ops um, automation team has, our data center automation team has, that actually goes through and examines the thermal state of the data center. And there's lots of really cool stuff that's happening that's controlling the louvers are, are all automatic and there's a whole control brain to the whole thing. Um, but in addition to that, um, the site ops team, what they do is it automatically monitors when one of these pods has too many servers turned off and will actually turn some back on um, just to go and act as those passive fans and help balance the cooling in the data center. So it's interesting that we we manage cooling in our data center partially by turning machines back on. Now, are those machines being, are using it for power saving with those machines on so that just the fans are running? Yeah, so that's, so the answer is no. Right now what we're doing is we're actually just putting a, just we're putting an OS on them and we're leaving them up and running. But that's actually a problem for us too because let's say that there's another shell shock or something. Um, this means that our security scanning picks up these machines as being like, hey, you need to go turn these, you know, you need to go upgrade this, uh, uh, whatever bash or whatever, or pseudo or whatever it is on this machine. And that's just like a lot of work for us to go and basically upgrade a package on a machine that really is just an inventory node. So one of the things we're looking into now is can we just wipe the drives entirely and just let them you know, is that going to be okay if they just sort of boot, go through this infinitely long booting process since they won't have an OS on them? Or do we need to put an OS image on there that's crippled? So it comes up, but it's on one that's like crippled in such a way that it has no network access. It could be interesting. I guess if you're, if you are putting an OS on it, you could at least use it for other workloads maybe. That's actually something we've been talking about. And I think that what I was gonna bring up when we talk about this actually, um, and I think Julia, you're moderating this one, right? Where we're talking about containers in um, in production on, was it Thursday? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> Thursday, Tuesday, it's, it's all the same. Um, yeah. So I think this is that, I think uh, we, we've had teams ask about that, um, that I, I'll want to talk about tomorrow for sure. And so I think if other folks are interested in that, that definitely make sure to, uh, to tune in for tomorrow's session as well. 
does anyone do um, automated management of like power loading? So the same thing like detect where there's power availability and moving workloads around in case of like, oh, this PDU is overloaded. Let's actually get things turned up over here instead. Uh, we don't, but our power circuits are kind of pretty over-provisioned and luckily we have a lot of power and that's all hydroelectric here. So usually power is pretty easy to come by um, on our side here. I, I think what James's point is kind of uh, driving the discussion towards is when you have a, a, a transformer and you're loading one side of the transformer, you actually lose a lot of efficiency because you've lopsided the load on it. Exactly. I, I haven't seen the use case you're describing, but, but much more dynamic um, operational control for the, the provisioning I do see, but it's the reasons are not as, I haven't seen it based on temperature or load specifically. But the, I mean, I think it's a general, you're talking about a general use case um, with a, spe or a specific use case with a general solution, a generalized solution. Cause once you can do that, it's really just a matter of what you're using to trigger the, the migrations or changes. Right. And I, well, I think a lot of it ties back to your hardware inventory because you, in order to know, you have to know what PDU and what transformers the machines are powered from in order to go, oh, I can turn off, I can turn on machine, machine set C, but not machine set D because that will lopsided in the other direction. I don't want to do that. I need to target this one specific area and without that power information, I think it's kind of difficult, but it's definitely a good problem. Hmm. Uh, would you drive that from like a CI automation or would, would it, I guess it depends on how, what's making the requests. So, so all right, go ahead. I, I think it would, you'd have a monitoring system that would be evaluating, that would have to look at each layer of the data center power in, inflow. So you'd have to go from all the way from the entrance, transfer switch, UPSs if, if you're there, transformers, and then there has to be enough correlating information to make it all the way down to the PDUs to be able to balance that load out. And then you have to be able to graph it and just somehow correlate that and display it and allow logic and humans to make decisions from there. Yeah, so actually what could be interesting uh, and Julia, what you were saying kind of made me think of this is, uh, and something our one of our data center automation team had mentioned is that, you know, they had mentioned uh, marking some machines in Ironic as unavailable for use. Basically, if those machines were on a PDU that they thought was overloading, but what occurs to me is there there could be some interesting opportunity for dynamically, you know, if something is is scanning PDUs, um, it could be updating something that is then used to wait scheduling decisions. Um, which already there's a lot of advantage to that because something our users really want, and I think this sort of is a, a, a tangent of something that's important to us is they want anti-affinity by power domains. So they wanna know specifically that their hardware is striped across multiple PDUs and in some cases, even multiple generators, right? You know, And it really comes down to like the use cases as a user, I wanna know that um, if there is a rack switch loss or a, even a PDU loss, I want to ensure that if I have four racks of gear that um, I will only ever lose, or I, I will be highly unlikely that I would ever lose more than one entire rack at a time so that I can ensure that at least 75% of my instances are still up and running if that happens. Um, is that, I mean, is this something that's interesting to anyone else? Because this is something our users have been asking for a lot. And I'm just so, curious if anyone's made any headway. <laughs> Um, I'll let somebody else talk, but I haven't, I haven't an answer also. Somebody else was going to jump in. Okay. So it might have been we, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we, we've been adding a, a pooling capability, which adds, instead of working with machines individually, you can 
basically say, give me a machine from a resource pool. And what you're describing sounds a lot like some of the use cases for that, where you could come in and say, you know, these, these machines are in a distributed pool across multiple PDUs, and then take them out or ask for machines that are in different PDUs. So rather than dealing with provisioning operations as a specific machine, then you're, you're, you're saying you're asking the system for resources that match a resource pool or a, a, some type of filter parameter from that perspective. And then you would have the ability and then from there it kicks off a workflow and you get the machines in whatever target state you want based on the input values. And so from what you're describing, it sounds like this and not, I'm, this ends up being a question to me because what you're, what you're describing sounds like a resource pool where you can selectively move machines. Because the, the number one, the, to me, it's, yay, I need to be able to pick machines, but I also need to be able, able to release machines and have them not in the zone where they were, or if they disappeared, come out of the system. So you sort of have a, it's a pooling behavior. Is that is that sort of what you're asking for? Yeah. It's not, the, it's not the use case I was imagining when we were, we were doing this, um, but it's a reasonable, it's a good use case. Yeah, I think that's kind of, it, I think it is certainly related to that. Yeah, like some kind of pooling behavior. And it's it's really about establishing, like you said, like pools or, or, or puddles or or just having some specific like depth of, of, uh, of anti-affinity domain. And in some cases, even affinity domains. We were working with, um, so J Pipes was working on something for a bit and it didn't get past the, uh, the, the blueprint stage. But um, if there's other folks that are interested in this, I think this would be like a useful thing for us to talk about too, in the long run. Um, sorry, my cat keeps nuzzling my laptop. I think that would be a good topic for the bare mail sake, at least to maybe consider and look at ways that it could, we can make it easier to help manage those loads or help pro provide some sort of integration point. Even if it's just go check this other thing <laughs> uh, yeah. and do power actions based upon that. Because right. we could definitely leave machines on with boot to network and not actually have network configuration if that helps. I'd say plus yeah. one for me, James, on being interested in, well, okay. the idea that Jay wrote, um, spoke about before. The, um, so I think he had this quite nice concept of trying to describe distance. Mm -hmm. So within the hierarchy inside placement. Exactly. Um, some of those bits in placement are a bit further along now, so it might be easier because they're on nested resource providers. So it might be you could model it in that, although the requests get horrendously complicated. But um, right. I think it's the same problem people have with VMs because it is the solution of AZs, but it's always too coarse. Yeah, and that's actually exactly one of the problems we have. Um, is that you know, we're, we're looking at AZs in our newest cloud environment, but it's just even then we're trying to encourage people to be in a very operate in a very cloudy way in this newest environment, but still for them AZs can be still be far too coarse. Um, an example, one of our applications that's a very it's it's a it's a very large property for us. They run like kind of a well known application. One of their parts of their environment they can only lose like one out of 48 machines or something at a time um or or like five out of 48 machines i forget the exact number but it's just it's very difficult to to, to give them that level of anti-affinity currently with just like random distribution of hardware and i think there's some opportunity here then if we have this other element that's able to weight things is like okay yeah i'll strike them across five pdus but avoid this one because it's getting kind of hot so let's just sort of send workloads elsewhere it, it almost Oh, sorry, sorry. Go, go ahead go ahead we're actually it, at time but julia go ahead and say what you're saying it, it's almost like we need the ability to, to do a generalized weighting system so that you can start deprioritizing areas of a data center based upon mm -hmm. external data and input and that may not be anything you have to actually make the schedule aware of other than user preference of scheduling over in this direction and then you need something that's way smarter that has a lot of the, the grouping information to be able to do the affinity or anti-affinity yeah. yeah, we should definitely go through that at some point, Jay's original idea. 
because it, yeah. it had a lot of the building blocks of that description. Yeah, I should dig that up. Hey, I got a question about your uh, your uh, racks. You said you had to leave the machines running to um, control the pressure of the airflow. Have you ever considered um, putting a, a sheet of plastic across the front of those uh, machines that were not used to prevent the airflow going through them? Just like a I, spacer in a rack, you know, for the blank spots. If I mean, I've never, I've never that's had actually the fortune. What we do. It's just a piece of plastic, but the problem is that after a while, it's going to, you got to replace that plastic. Yeah. In fact, what we do is actually for for empty spots and racks, we actually have metal blanks that we put in. Yeah. Um, that are like one, two, four, six U. The problem yeah, yeah. Is, when, is when machines are turned off, um, then air is blowing the other way. And we talked a little bit about like louvers on the backs of machines so that when the pressure wanted to go the wrong way, sort of like a check valve to stop air from going out the front of the machine, but it just, in the long run, the, you know, building things that way to have a, a, a set of like shuttered louvers sitting over the back of every machine that would just drop in place and sort of seal if the machine was powered off ended up being less cost effective, I think, um, than, yeah. than just turning some of the machines back on. Okay, and then another thing that's like, maybe I'm missing the point earlier, um, every rack that, every data center that I designed with with the racks, I always had two separate power, power supplies coming to every single rack. And then my uh, PDU bars all had uh, amp readouts on how many amps were being drawn on each bar. So, but I, I, the, the business investment of automating all that versus just walking over there and looking at the, the LEDs when you're building it and kind of balancing the rack, um, we never had a need to go back to to make an adjustment on those. It was mainly the racks that you had weird pieces of equipment and it wasn't a rack that just full of what we call pizza boxes. You know, it's weird equipment that we always have to balance. Um, the racks that uh, were full of pizza boxes, we just did the math on the number of amps and made sure that we could control full load at, uh, for all the servers. So. I was just curious, and and the the temperature discussion was, I've had temperature drops, and we've sent people over to the data center. What the hell is going on? It was a small system, and every month it would it would happen, and we finally figured out ah, that's the AC guy. He's shutting off the blowers, and he's replacing those filters, and it, the mach the blowers are down for like two minutes, and then he's gone, and then we go in, and so we finally put a camera in to find out what what why the temperature dropped i mean i mean the, right. the, the, why the room got hot uh and uh, the racks that uh, we did have issues with we had a little temperature gauge on a on an ethernet cord we dropped two or three in one at the bottom one in the middle one at the top to try to adjust the airflow on the box and then we move it to some other place but anyway before you left i just wanted to see about that yeah thanks for sharing that that was actually pretty cool thank you Sure. Yeah, and so actually we're we're about four minutes over time, so I think we're at a wrap. I believe uh, Jonathan so, is going to jump in. I yeah, I uh, I am. I was actually going to ask Mohammed and you if you uh, had any major takeaways from the day that you wanted to to kind of highlight as we wrap up. I can uh, go first to give some time for James. <laughs> so um, I think it was a really interesting conversation. We had a lot of um, uh, different people uh, chiming in uh, from different uh, scales of infrastructure. So, you know, from a much smaller scale up to the scale of like China Mobile um, and Verizon and CERN. So um, it was really interesting to hear um, some of the different contrasts of how, you know, certain uh, individuals deal with, let's say, kind of uh, off-lease hardware that you don't really have the privilege of having everything prepared the way you like it to having uh, someone at a different uh, site scale where uh, like James where you know he gets a printout of all the machines that are in this rack and they scan one thing and they know it's that to a whole another scale of China Mobile where they raise tenders and people go and accommodate for their needs you know which would be really nice for all of us but 
um, you know, it's, it's, it's different cases for uh, different environments. I think it was also a really good conversation um, towards the end where we talked about all the different platforms um, and how to do kind of uh, inspection as time goes by and how uh, things are uh, changing always in the data center and how to track all those changes. So that's part some really interesting conversation um, around Ironic and the features that it offers uh, to do these things. And um, we got to hear from a lot of different perspectives uh, from a, a different scale. Um, and I think this was a, a really kind of interesting and productive conversation. Uh, we've got a really awesome etherpad um, that's kind of an artifact of, of all of this discussion. And I'm hoping that uh, we take a lot of discussion on to forwards to things like the uh, bare metal SIG um, to continue to discuss uh, some of these. That's mostly kind of for under the topics that we were talking about. And for the bare metal SIG, um, that is uh, generally coordinated on the OpenStack Discuss mailing list. Is that correct? Yes. So um, I think we can actually quickly post a chat. So this is an etherpad, I think, that is uh, used by the bare metal SIG and the participants of it. So if you're there, I think that has a lot of the information, some of the meeting, proposed goals and whatnot. So you can go there and reach out um, or as well as participate on the mailing list. Yeah. One thing every week uh, during the ironic meeting, we try to uh, have a checkpoint for the bare metal SIG. If there's anything we need to talk about or discuss, and that gives us a chance to bring those people together and with the ironic community and just see if there's anything that we can do. Okay, cool. And then uh, James, you uh, around, I think it was line 201 in the etherpad, you uh, were talking about a uh, kind of an SOPs document for um, managing TPM. That's a lot of acronyms. Um, yeah. we, need a, we need a document to define the acronyms too. The, uh, <laughs> but that, that seems like something that, uh, that a, a handful of people were interested in. Um, Mark and Julia mentioned the, the bare metal white paper um, earlier. And I think that, that you know, getting, getting these, uh, these real world experiences that people have and, uh, and, and you know, being able to write them down for reference ends up being something that is super useful and sometimes overlooked in open source communities. So if, uh, if anyone else is interested in joining that effort, um, you know, feel free to add your contact info into the etherpad there. Um, are there any other things like that you think, James, that are good next steps? Absolutely. In fact, Dan, um, so that was one of them, certainly collaborating on, on TPM programming and sort of uh, best practices and SOPs. Uh, another thing is um, uh, capture, making sure uh, or, or gathering folks that want to work together on uh, grabbing the power affinity grouping and weighting stuff. So that's actually down in line 238. So go ahead and put your names in there if you're interested. Um, and then the final thing I thought that was really interesting, we didn't put a spot in the etherpad for this yet, is uh, the larger problem of how do we capture um, per, you know, for doing firmware upgrades, is there a place that we can all start to collaborate to capture both the method on a per vendor, per platform basis, um, as well as any other useful information or starting points on just like known good or bad firmware, like this vendor, this firmware for this, you know, for like um, Linux kernels 3.10 and above you know, there are some issues and some gotchas to be aware of. Uh, just because right now, all the different deployers out there, large and small, are all actually going and replicating this effort over and over and over again. And if we can find a way to sort of centralize that, maybe we can start to, to get some good, uh, make get some use out of it. Okay. And I see that's happening, looks like on line um, 213. Um, I can go and uh, I can, I can typey typey that and just capture that a little bit and then but another opportunity for people to list names yes. to see if folks want to self-organize. Okay, great. Well, um, we'll uh, we will wrap today up. I'm gonna pass it to Ashley to uh, kind of close everything out and, and tell us uh, the plan for um, for the rest of the week. So take it away, Ashley. Cool. Um, great summary, y'all. Thanks so much for doing that. Um, I enjoyed that. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, everybody make sure to come back tomorrow. Um, we'll be talking about consuming bare metal for um, to uh, for provisioning cloud-based workloads. Um, we'll cover everything from 
hyperconverged workloads to uh, serverless to uh, some security and um, auto scaling preemptible bare metal. So um, lots of topics tomorrow. So make sure to come back uh, same time, same place. Um, then Wednesday is obviously um, networking. So yeah, make sure to do that. And then we're also going to drop um, a quick survey that it's, you know, two or three questions, super short. Um, we just want to get an idea of what you all are most interested in talking about um, for those topics tomorrow. Um, so just go in there, check off a couple boxes of what you are most interested in discussing tomorrow so that our moderators can kind of help direct the conversation um, to make it the most beneficial for you all. So please do that um, before you duck out of here and then we will see you all tomorrow. That's it. Have a good time with Open Dev. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. See you. See you tomorrow. Good morning. Nice to see everyone again.